hopefully everyone um, is looking forward to some stimulating and um, interesting discussion on political topics, which is uh, is going to be critical this year. Um, my name is Ham Gad. I'm with the Homeowners Association, and one of the things that we do as part of the HOA is to have political forums. Uh, we've had a number over the, the past couple of years and will continue to. We also want to thank the Leadership Big Canoe Group, which has, uh, has made one of their projects to help Big Canoe uh, both in a registration drive as well as informative uh, forums. So they, uh, they're a big help as well. We have a number of guests here, which we thank all of them for coming. We know there's quite a few people that are, uh, that are here to hear the candidates. And the four candidates that we have, and we will have all of them arrayed up here. Uh, we have Hunter Bignell. We have Doug Collins. <coughs> Excuse me. We have Cliff McDuffie and Martha Zoller. They are all vying to be the con uh, congressional candidate that will appear on the November 6th election. The primary is July the 31st. Now you may ask, well, we already have a congressman, Tom Graves, and that's correct. As you may have noticed, we've had a redistricting, and this was the old Congressional District map, we have a new one which essentially takes Big Canoe and moves that into a new Congressional District, which is the ninth District. So what's coming up is that July 30th will be the general primary. Uh, excuse me, the 31st, my mistake. Um, that you will be able to vote for these candidates, and then if a runoff occurs, that runoff will happen on August 21st. So I got that right. Uh, what I would like to do at this point is to have the four candidates, if you could, come up and please um, have a, a seat right up here. Uh, and I will also ask them to give a two-minute introduction, self-introduction on who they are, what their background is, and why they are running to be our new congressperson. So with that, I think we could just do this maybe in alphabetical order. Okay, now the format, just to again give you a little idea as to what we're going to do. We have a range of, um, of issue questions that I'll be posing to each candidate, each candidate will get the opportunity to answer the same question. We'll do it in a rotating order so everyone has an opportunity to go first. After that, we want to have questions, then each candidate will have an opportunity for a uh, two-minute closing. So with that, Hunter, thank you. Thank you, Ann. It's really nice to be here. It's good to see all of you. We didn't know what to expect in terms of the crowd, and this is really pleasing. I am Hunter Bicknell. Um, I live in Jackson County. I'm chairman of the Jackson County Board of Commissioners. I have been for the last, I'm in my fourth year, the first time I've ever held elective office, however. Uh, I have been a businessman for roughly 40 years, uh, educated as a businessman with a bachelor's and master's degrees and have had my feet on the ground in the business world, both in the corporate world, as well as a small business owner and uh, operator of medium-sized companies also. Uh, I decided I wanted to run for Congress about three months ago now. Looking forward to the campaign. We're having a great time getting to know some wonderful candidates and uh, look forward to the next five months. Hope that you will see your way clear to understand why you should vote for me as your congressman. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here. From my background, it's pretty, uh, part of my background is been behind the 
podium like this in a church like this because for 11 years I was pastor of a church in Gainesville, Georgia. I have a little bit of a varied background. I pastored for over 11 years. I have uh, served and currently serve at the uh, Dobbins Air Force Base, and I served as a chaplain where I served in Iraq in 2008. Also had with my wife, who uh, we started a couple of companies. One was a scrapbooking company. I'll have to say that I've learned a lot about business. I never knew I learned anything about scrapbooking at that time. But I've also been, uh, went back later in life and got my law degree. At age 38, took a step of faith out and went uh, back to law. So I can already see the looks on many of your faces. Uh, how do you take a pastor and a preacher and a politician? Well, it's just grace and law on both sides here. <laughs> when we look at that, what I uh, run for office in 2006, I ran for uh, the Georgia House. And I've been serving in the Georgia House and the Citizen Legislature now for the last six years. Had the privilege now of serving Rick Jaspers and Steve Gooch, who I see are both here. And also, you have a wonderful chaplain up here named Lynn Walker, uh, who is a dear friend and a good guy. I'm here today to, well, these other fine candidates to tell you that, they, that this is the most important election I believe we've got coming up. And I want to be a consistent conservative voice. It's what I've been all of my life in public service and also in our, my private life as well. And I look forward to answering questions today because we have a, a big job ahead of us. We've got a lot of answers that need to be uh, given. we also got a lot of problems that need to be tackled. And I look forward to doing that today. Thank you. My name is Clifton McGuffey. I was uh, born and raised in a little town called Fitzgerald, Georgia, which is south of Macon. I uh, ran the Chamber of Commerce in Fitzgerald for a number of years, went from there to Albany, from there to Waycross, was hired to be the Chief Executive in the Hall County Chamber of Commerce in 1981 through 1992. I own my own business. My business cards are back there on the table along with a copy of my resume. Most of my career has been spent on bringing industry in, into Georgia. And um, over 5,000 new industrial jobs in Hall County, literally 10 to 15,000 probably, if you took my whole career and put that in place. Now I know y'all do not want the new Caterpillar factory right here in the middle of Big Canoe. I, I understand that. But the people down south of you need those jobs. Our unemployment rate in some of our counties uh, is really uh, expanded up to maybe 30 percent in some areas. I really think that uh, our economy is the number one issue that we have. I brought with me today a copy of the foreclosures in Hall County for the month of February. 20 pages of foreclosures in Hall County alone for the month of February. You want to get those foreclosure pages erased? Find those people jobs. Please vote for me and let me help them. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Martha Zoller, and I know many of you all because I have visited up here before. I've broadcasted live from Big Canoe, and I also have had a media career for the last 15 years. I've also worked in the corporate world where I managed up to 60 people. Uh, some of those folks are still working for Macy's. I worked for Riches, now it's Macy's. Uh, I do a good job of training people and moving people on into new positions. I've also helped run my husband's medical practice for the last 22 years, and uh, there's a lot of business that, that has changed a lot, but nothing has changed more than the medical industry. I've also built a media career as well as raised a family. My brother's in the audience right now, Frank Mitchell, and uh, Frank was kind of, in a way, the reason why I'm here today, because when we used to sit around the dinner table and talk about politics, I was much younger, sorry Frank, I'm much younger than Frank, uh, but we'd sit around and talk about politics, and I was a reader even then, and I used to say, I read in this or I read in that, and Frank would say to me, are you going to believe everything you read? And he caused me to be a critical thinker. And throughout the rest of my life, I have not assumed that I know everything. I have read and I have studied, and a lot because my older brother said to me, Martha, are you going to believe everything you read? And I went back and I studied and I did different things. But I want to take what I have learned throughout my lifetime in business, in uh, the media career, where I have seen the way politicians act on the record and off the record. I have seen how the sausage is made even though I have not made the sausage. But I do believe that it's extremely important and this election is important. And we need to elect people that are going to say, why are we doing things this way? Are you going to believe everything you read? Thank you, folks, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, I think everyone will agree we've got some um, excellent qualified candidates. So now we'd like to uh, turn their attention to minute and a half 
uh, bonus points for brevity. So, uh, uh, but issues related questions and answers. Uh, the first question, and each will get to answer the same question, um, deals with jobs. What two job creation programs or incentives do you favor for bringing jobs to Georgia? And what two job related regulations would you eliminate? Okay. Why don't we start in that same order and then we'll just rotate the order. Right now we have great incentive programs in the state of Georgia. The state offers a job tax credit for new employment that has been very effective in track, attracting industry to our state. Uh, we also have a good work ready training program that the state provides. These are probably the two outstanding programs at the state level. At the local level, though, also the state partners with county and city governments in trying to provide uh, forms of tax abatements. Uh, these are used uh, depending on the attractiveness of the industry, how bad you want them, and how much you're willing to abate their taxes over a period of time. So those are actually three things that can be done to attract industry to Georgia and have been done very effectively. We've done it effectively in Jackson County. We've actually brought um, over 1,500 new jobs to Jackson County in the last three months alone by four different employers. Um, as, as, what was the second part of the question? Uh, what two job-related regulations would you eliminate? Okay. One is very serious and it's upon us right now, and that is Obamacare. We have got to eliminate Obamacare, repeal it, because that's a regulation that is really a job killer. We just cannot continue to allow that. Uh, another thing is, it's not a regulation yet, but I think we have to be very, very careful about unions. We need to uh, not allow card check. We've got to stop the union movement, which Obama is pushing. Thank you. Well, the first and foremost is that I, that when the, the wording of the question is what two job creation programs I'd like to see brought to order, is the first very brief the answer is no. I think the government needs to get out of the job creation program. I think that's part of the problem we've got now is that the government is actually getting in the way and programs of the federal government, the state government, we need to get out of the way of the free market. And I think when you look at these job creation programs, they end up with more red tape and more problems than they ever started. I think incentives, like we have done before, go back to job tax credits, quality job tax credits that we're working on currently in the state of Georgia, which I'm working on right now with this governor to, to provide uh, better incentives for our companies to come in. Also having the ability to uh, make a better environment for the uh, counties and cities can attract these business offers. But I think from a program and perspective, I think we need to go out of the program business and more into getting out of the way so the free market can run. How do the regulations? Where do we start? I think you've got two in particular that you can look at. The Obamacare, that is the, the number one, we understand that. But there's a couple other areas that really, when you get into jobs and job work, you've got to look at our banking industry right now, which took a complete swing. We've got to get the banks being able to lend money again and get our economy moving. And we've also got to get our regulations out of the way to where it's easier, as a, young, as a man in Elbert County told me, it's easier for him to buy from China than to bring it out of the ground in Elbert County. That's got to change. We've got to stop those kind of programs. That's an excellent question. I think everybody would agree with that. I think we probably have enough incentives on the table. I told someone yesterday in a summer type meeting that um, one of our problems is, and I'm standing on the tarmac at the Gainesville Hall County Airport, the president of Teledyne gets off the plane and walks over and we introduce ourselves to him. His first question to me before we go anywhere is, why is Georgia last in education? Try answering that, standing there with the plane engine still running, and I'm afraid he's going to leave, right? Well, we got the plan, all right? They made cruise missile engines in Gainesville for a number of years. Teledyne did. I couldn't answer the question, but what I asked him and told him that we needed to do was go visit some schools and let him look at our education system. And we did. We went to North Hall and we went to Gainesville High School and he was more than pleased. Sometimes Georgia is eliminated because we're last in education. That is one thing that needs to be dealt with. Everybody that's in high school does not need to take 
the college entrance exam. Colorado, somewhere, Nevada, only eight people took it one year. Guess who's number one in education? It's not us. We are eliminated before we even get started sometimes because we're so low in education. Uh, I think this, if you have a cure for cancer, but don't bother to tell anybody you hadn't done much. We need to increase our marketing effort, our marketing effort. Uh, as far as programs that we need, first of all, government does not create jobs. I think we've established that. But there are certain things that are constitutionally called upon, and that has to do with interstate commerce, it has to do with the waterways, and that sort of thing. So I think something that government could do is continue with the support of the Savannah Port Project, because that's not only going to help South Georgia, but it's going to help North Georgia and create jobs all throughout the area, and it's constitutionally based. I am very much a constitutionalist, and the government should only be doing what is constitutional, and we need to be getting rid of the rest, and that's extremely important to me. But we also need to make sure that we're on a fair playing field as far as free trade is concerned. Uh, we ought to approve free trade agreements and that sort of thing. So those are the two things we can do to help bring jobs. The things that we need to get rid of, I think have been said already before, Obamacare needs to be gotten rid of, but what are we going to replace it with? We're going to replace it with possibly the plan I like by Dr. Tom Price. There's a new plan that's going to be introduced this week by Dr. Paul Brown. I would love more to see Republicans get together and come up with one plan that they'd like to replace Obamacare with, but right now we've got two very good ones. But the other two bits of regulation that need to be gotten rid of is Dodd-Frank that has to do with banking and Sarbanes-Oxley that has to do with the fact you have to keep every email you've ever written at your business. So there's a lot of things going on with that. So those are things we can do and things we need to get out of. Thank you. Uh, that was a pretty good segue into our next issue, which is health care. <clears throat> Uh, do you support Obamacare? And I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> if so, why? And I think I know the answer to that. But if not, what would you replace it with? And Doug, why don't you lead off here? All right. And this one I think is easy. We can all we can. This is probably one we've seen uh, together. Obamacare? No, it was an abomination. It is an abomination. It needs to be done away with. Now. The House has already repealed it. That's an easy vote. We continue that process. But where do we really go next? I think this is where we've got to come together, and there's been a couple of plans mentioned. But there, what we've got to do is, again, look back at free market solutions here. And one of the things that has been looked at is you've got to look at the drivers of cost when you look at this. And one of the things that, as I have, unfortunately, never asked for uh, a special knowledge of is those put in the uninsurable pool. Those who have special needs. My daughter has spina bifida. And we've had a constant battle with uh, these kind of issues in insurance. But what you do is, is uh, in Washington just a few years ago, one of the first things that was eliminated when Obamacare wanted to take over everything was they took programs that were actually working. And one of those programs was to take the monies that were being used and combine into a workable <coughs> solution for those who are uninsurable and to get them out of that market and but provide them with what they need, but at the same time take the cost care down. There are other areas, well, the other thing, and I'm an attorney, but I'll tell you right now, we have got to change our tort reform system. We have got to, that is something that, that was off the table, and it's got to be back on the table. I've got something we're working on right now that I look forward to sharing in the next month. It's going to be revolutionary when we look at the area of tort reform. Uh, the answer is no, no, and no. Uh, I'm not for any of, of the uh, current programs in practice. I told someone the other day who told me they had lost, this is how fouled up things are. They said they'd lost their health care. I said, well, let me tell you what you do. Just go down there at the corner, rob that bank. The police will come pick you up. They'll take you to jail. Tell them you're sick. They will rush you to the Hall County Hospital because they do not want you to die in the jail. And the taxpayers of Hall County will pay all the bills. <laughs> That's called free medical care by the taxpayers. If you're sick, please, and don't have any insurance, go to the emergency room. Somebody will pay the bill. Um, I think that Obamacare is obnoxious and needs to be done away with. It's ridiculous. Um, my doctor told me recently at a physical that I was doing just fine. I said, please don't tell me that. I'll probably have a heart attack walking to the car and die in the parking lot. Uh, he told me, I asked him this question, what could be done better? He said, doctors are under mandates. We have to do certain things and certain tests because we're required to do them and it drives up your medical insurance cost. 
Um, my husband's a primary care physician. He's also the jail doc in Hall County, Cliff. Um, so uh, I can tell you that he's driven those costs down over the last few years from about $7.60 a head to about three sixty dollars a head. So uh, he's a very conservative practitioner of medicine uh, in the Hall County uh, Detention Center. But he had, he's a 57-year-old primary care physician, okay? He's looking at retirement, or at least was before 2008, was looking at retirement. Uh, but he had a guy come in from the hospital to kind of talk with him about what to expect as Obamacare is rolled out. And one of the things that he's going to be required to do if he's still in practice when Obamacare goes in is to spend $50,000 for a software program to make him compatible with Obamacare. Now, when you're 57 years old and you're looking at a few years down the road for retirement, spending $50,000 on a program is not very cost effective. And what's going to happen is a lot of guys in his age group are going to decide they don't really need to stay in medicine because they can't afford to stay in medicine. So I would like to see Obamacare repealed. That's going to happen, I think. Um, I'm watching what the Supreme Court is going to do. But I think we have to have a free market replacement. And I do like Paul Brown's plan and, and uh, Tom Price's plans. I'd like to see them get together. But we need to be reasonable about this, and we need to get back to free market solutions. There are some great ones in the House that are being stacked up like cordwood in the Senate. So we not only need changes in the House, we need changes in the Senate, and we need changes in the White House. Thank you. <laughs> They've covered it pretty well. One thing that I would like to add to that, though, is that America has had the best health care of any nation in the world for years now. And that's because we have had a free market that has enabled the industry to innovate and educate and do things to where we're able to be on the leading edge. Obamacare will kill that. Our future will look more like that of Europe and Canada as far as health care is concerned if we don't repeal Obamacare. Thank you. Now we'll deal with uh, taxes, one of everybody's favorite subjects. Uh, do you support the recent extension of the payroll tax and the unemployment benefit legislation to extend those benefits? And would you support extension of the Bush tax cuts? So, Cliff, let's start with you all. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was taking that brevity comment for a <laughs> Look, it's simple, it's common sense. No, I don't support any tax increases or extending any benefits or uh, making anybody pay any more taxes, all right? I brought a document with me that you'll be interested in that says that federal employees owe $3.4 billion in non-paid taxes. This past year, the federal government spent $1.6 billion on cell phones and the fees for cell phones for people who live below the poverty line. Look, they want to cut back on Medicare and they want to cut back on Social Security. Just take all the waste that we're currently incurring and do away with the waste and we'll have plenty of money. No new taxes. I certainly don't ever want to be a Republican that says I'm not in favor of a tax cut. But to do the payroll tax cut without determining how you're going to pay for it and taking funds out of Social Security without fixing Social Security was irresponsible. So, uh, you know, it's irresponsible for those of you who are collecting Social Security. This is the first year in history that we're actually taking more out of the Social Security system than we're putting in because a lot of you folks and people like me are deciding to retire at 62 instead of 65 because we're not convinced it's going to be there. So I would not have voted for the payroll tax extension uh, because I think that it was irresponsible to do it without paying for it because in this case, they were taking money out of a program that was being paid out to people who had paid into it. It's an insurance program, Social Security is. It's not an entitlement. But I do want to see changes in taxes. You know, I would like to see uh, the Bush tax cuts extended, but unfortunately that's going to be, have to be handled by this Congress. And I don't know if they're going to do it or not. They're going to expire at the end of this year, so this Congress is going to have to handle that. So that's one thing, and I'd like to see them extend it. But I am a fair taxer. I believe in the fair tax as something that should be in, put in place, that all roads lead to tax replacement. 
Um, I'm glad that 999 is on the table because that's a path on the way to the fair tax. Uh, but we have got to have fundamental tax reform. Uh, as my daughter said to me once, income tax is so 20th century. We need to move into the 21st century as far as how we tax people. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I've got it. Um, the last point, um, continuing the Bush tax cuts, we really need to do that. That's going, it was like Martha points out, that is, um, that will expire at the end of this year. We as candidates, whichever one's elected, won't have any input on that unless we, unless it is not continued and we have to go work to try to get it reinstituted. That would be an uphill battle though. So. I definitely would like to see the Bush tax cuts extended. I agree with Martha wholeheartedly. You, you don't take funding for a program that people have been paying into for years and cut the tax rate when it's a program that's struggling to stay solvent to begin with. So that was somewhat irresponsible. Uh, and we got the Republicans got trapped into that one. Uh, what was the third point? Um, would be just the extension of the payroll tax and unemployment benefit legislation. Yeah. Unemployment. Okay. Unemployment, the un unemployment benefits should not have been extended the way they are. I, I support unemployment benefits. Employers pay into it dearly, but their premiums that they pay are based on a fixed period of time for the benefit to exist and to then continue it and extend it for a much longer period of time is something that, as Martha points out, it's not paid for. You've got to figure out how you're going to pay for that before you have that program. I think this one is one that goes back to experience. It goes back to consistency. One of the things on this one, extending the payroll tax cuts and doing the unemployment insurance because we had to, that was leadership saying we got ourselves in a bind and we got to get out of it. I would have joined Tom Graves and, the, and the other, most of the other regular delegation from Georgia, Republican delegation voted against this. This was another time when we were, again, making a political choice and saying we've got to feel something and not paying for it. We've got to stop doing that. That means that you sometimes have to stand up to leadership. If you look at my record, you can go back in the State House and I have done that. I've stood up to a corrupt speaker. I know what it's like to vote against leadership. I know what it's like to be threatened with every position in the world if you don't do it. And that's exactly what's happening right now in Washington to our representatives saying, if you can't be a team player, you can't go along with it. Let me just say this. When the leadership's right, I'll vote with them. When the leadership's wrong, they're going to get a no vote. When we understand that uh, part of it, these benefits just didn't need to be extended on that uh, part of it as we go along. The second part of the question was, was the of the Bush Bush tax cuts. We, bottom line here, we just got the, the tax code system we've got now, whether it's, it's a fair tax, which I support, whether there are other plans out there on the table, it's broke, it's not even fixable anymore, no more band-aids, throw it away, let's start over, let's get it back where we have a, a tax system in this country that benefits those who actually get out and work and those who are not sitting on the sidelines taking from this economy. Okay, now we'll turn our attention to um, how our taxes are spent. Uh, this is a two-part question. Which two federal programs or departments would you eliminate? And what specific legislation would you propose to cut federal spending? And Martha, this is your first one. Thank you. Um, you know, first of all, and what was the first part of the question? Which two federal programs or would departments would you eliminate? Uh, energy, EPA, and education. Okay, I got it right, Rick Perry. Had a little trouble with it in the debate. But those are the three you need to start with. Okay, there needs to be dramatic reduction throughout, but that's where you need to start. You know, the Department of Defense has been asked over the last couple of years to cut close to a trillion dollars over 10 years. No other department has been asked to do that. And I think that in, in, to be responsible, you need to ask every department to do that, not just the Department of Defense. I'm not going to deny, as a strong supporter of the military, I, but I'm not, I, I certainly am not going to deny that there is some areas that you can cut. But to only ask defense and the other 13 departments get left alone, that's a problem. So in spending, those are the three departments I would start with, but it would not be where I would end. I support cut, cap, and balance and have advocated for it and supported it. I have also supported Paul Ryan's plan, but I don't think it goes far enough. 
Rand Paul also put on the table $500 billion beginning this year. I think that's a good place to start. I think we need to put everything on the table. We need to communicate it well. And if you elect me and I'm doing my job, there's going to be some things that you don't like because there's going to be some things you like that I'm going to be talking about cutting. But we're going to communicate it well. We're going to be working together on the project together. And by doing that, we're going to move this country in the right direction. That's right. Uh, it's real easy to point out the departments that need to be eliminated. The three that Martha mentioned, the EPA, energy, education. But we know there's waste in government from top to bottom in all areas. Tremendous waste. It will be easy, well, not for some. Uh, the people who are on the short end of the cuts, it won't be easy for them, but we have to do it. We have to get our fiscal house in order. The number one problem we have facing us today is overspending. We cannot continue to add a trillion, trillion and a half dollars annually to our deficit. We're already sitting at over $15 trillion. We, we have got a limit as to where we can go. And these programs that suggest cutting in terms of even hundreds of billions of dollars is totally inadequate. We can, we can do that just by eliminating waste. We've got to think in terms of trillions of dollars of waste that are in programs that can be eliminated. There are programs that can be eliminated that add up to tremendous amounts of money. So there's room to cut. We certainly know the, the three most obvious departments that do not benefit us. There's nothing on earth that the EPA does that the state's EPDs can't do for us. State departments of education can do more. They're the closest to the students. They know best what's, what is best for our students. So we can rely on the State Department of Education to do this. Thank you. I think this one is an easy one. Energy, <coughs> education, just, let's just take a list of uh, start with what we need to cut and get it out of Washington. I think the biggest thing that we're here is we talk about energy and education, but there's one out there right now that I'm excited about. In fact, I talked to Congressman Tom Graves about it just the other day. It's the Department of Transportation. As a consistent, conservative voice in action, I know how to work a budget. I know what you do to take and starve departments. And one of the things we can do right now is the Department of Transportation has been milking it for too long with the motor fuel tax and, and the federal highway system. It's time we follow, and, and I would love to work again with my, who I worked with when he was in the State House, Congressman Graves, to work to bring that back to the states. Again, the best government is at the local and state level. Let's get it out of Washington. This is a program in which we can work with, and it's one that's not been talked about. But this one is one we can do right now. And I look forward to, to talking more about that, but that's the transportation area. The other thing about it is, is I'm also standing here before you for the last three years who have presented a bill to actually cut a department in the state of Georgia. Now that's an amazing kind of thing because nobody wanted to do it. When I first introduced it, I thought Sonny Perdue was going to have a cow. <laughs> cut a department. Well, last week, two weeks ago, and it's in the Senate, just passed the Senate committee, we're actually on my authorship, and the governor picked it up as part of his legislation. We're cutting out the state personnel administration, say, cutting 40 hard jobs, saving $2.6 million. That's the clear, cons consistent, conservative message that I want to take to Washington. These departments can be cut. You just got to know how to do it. I've been the manager of four chambers of commerce in Georgia. I've been the president of the Georgia Chamber of Commerce Executives Association, the Georgia Economic Developers Association. I was chairman of the Quick Start Advisory Board for the Votech Schools for the state of Georgia. Every, and I was a marketing officer for the First National Bank in Albany, Georgia for about three years. Every one of those positions, all right, you know what we had to do? Balance the budget, please. We are not going to get any expenditures under control or any tax regulations under control or anything else under control and to do exactly what you have to do, which is balance your budget. I go to a rather large church. Our budget last year, Blackshear Place Baptist Church in Oakwood, Georgia. Last year, I was, our budget was $6.8 million. We collected over $7 million. What a wonderful experience, right? To have a surplus instead of a deficit. Balance the budget. That's my answer. Now something uh, 
that hits home near and near to a lot of us is entitlement reform. Um, and again, a two-part question here. Are you in favor of raising the Social Security retirement age and are you in favor of means testing on benefits? That obviously is a very sensitive and delicate subject. <laughs> many of us have paid into Social Security, including myself, for many, many years. Uh, it's not an entitlement. It's something we have earned. We have contributed to it. And the government should have held on and protected those resources, which they have not done. Uh, certainly not done to the extent they should. The system is broke and it's got to be fixed even in light of the fact that it's unpleasant. I do advocate delaying the retirement age only for those who are young enough to recover and be able to adjust in time prior to the retirement age. Uh, if you're 55 or under or maybe some other age that's lower than that, delay your retirement. We live much longer today. Uh, when retirement was first put in place, we were probably living at least eight, ten years shorter lifespan at that time. So there is room today to work until, you know, retiring early at 62 is, is really great if you can do it. But many of us that have passed 62, we still think we have a lot to offer and, and plan to work for quite some time. Uh, we can work until we're beyond age 62, 65, and actually I think my wife's retirement age is like 66.8 months or 66 and eight months. So let's, we have to address it. We've got to fix the system. So yes, I would support uh, modifying Social Security. I think the biggest issue here is the reason Social Security is, is difficult. It is it's something that, that we've been promised and, and a generation has been playing into and, and had a Washington that lied and, and broke the promise. And now we've got a problem we've got to look at. It's just really damaging our budget. One of the things is, I want to say to this part, I think the, the way we fix this, though, is you've got to start and, and look at it from a certain age and say, from 55, I believe 55 and over, the Paul Ryan plan sort of said 55 and over, you sort of take off the table. That's, that's just one right now. You're already there. There's no time to react. And for those who are drawing, it needs to, to be there. And that's a promise and a promise kept. Now, beyond that, what you've got to look at, so, is, is look at what do we do. I believe that we can look at private accounts. I believe we've got to still have a month funding mechanism to maintain those that are already there, the maintains that are already drawing. But we've got to be able to take and look at all options. And this is what's not being done because this is not an easy subject. But under 55, whether it be a, a private option where they can actually uh, look at what they're going to be uh, paying into, whether it's a retirement age increase. There's one last thing that I want to say about means testing, and this comes up. When the government can take your money at the end, so to speak, of a gun barrel and force you to pay into something, it doesn't matter how successful you've been, then I would say if they want to means test it, then give it back what you've already paid into it. That's something we got to look at. Hallelujah, I draw Social Security. <laughs> One of the things that may happen, though, is I will probably, unless there's a great miracle that transpires, I may not live long enough to collect all back that I paid in. Okay? You know why that's the problem? Because the Social Security Trust Fund at the federal level has been robbed. They have borrowed all the money and spent it on what I call do-good projects. It won't be put back. Um, I think leaving Social Security alone, just let the people fund it like it's been going. We don't need a means test. We don't, we don't need to mess with the age brackets. What we need to do is quit stealing from Social Security. You know, there are three things that got us into this mess today. You had the passage of the 16th Amendment, which allowed us to tax income. The passage of the 17th Amendment, which allowed for direct election of senators. And even though you might not always trust your state legislators, it was better when the state legislature was appointing senators. But the final and biggest thing happened in 1966 when LBJ mixed all of the entitlement money, all of the Social Security and Medicare money with the general fund. Because if you think about back to 1966, we baby boomers um, were starting to enter the workforce and all kinds of money was coming into the treasury. And people thought, oh, we can just borrow it now and we'll pay it back later. It's kind of like Wimpy on Popeye. 
you know, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for your hamburger today. That's not what happened. So we've got this problem here that we've got to fix because of that. Now, we know how we got here, but here's what we can do to fix it. Right now, I'm in that 66 and 10 months uh, group where I'm going to, it's going up to 67. Tomorrow, we could raise the Medicare age to 67. If Social Security is 67, Medicare ought to be 67. And that would be tens of millions of, tens of billions of dollars right off the bat. We could fix that. But I do think we're going to have to look at 55 and over off the table. People 40 to 55 years old are going to have a different kind of program, including private accounts and that kind of thing. And those that are under 40, they're very independent about this. They would rather just know what the plan's going to be, and then they can fix it. We can do this, but we've got to communicate it well. Uh, anyone who has been to the gas station lately knows that uh, it costs you a whole lot more to fill up your tank of gas. So... Dealing with the uh, issue of energy resources, would like to pose just the general question of what two programs, ideas, pieces of legislation would you uh, be in favor of that would help address uh, the cost of gasoline and the cost of our energy over the next few years? And if you want to lead off. Well, I think this is when we get into energy. One of the things that it was, as many of us in this room, I think, can, can say is, is just very recently, again, we have another failed administrative policy. We now have another failed president who said no to not only jobs, but oil from Canada. And speaking from one who has been in Iraq and been bombed by those who don't like us, who sell us our oil now, I don't want to keep paying for oil from over there. I'd rather pay the Canadians for oil. I'd rather get that oil down here and refine it here and put it back in the system here. That's in the that area that should be, and I support the Congress in trying to force the President's hand on this issue. We've got to put in common sense. But there's other things that we can do. We can look at our, our natural gas. We can begin to look at how do we use that in our vehicles. How do we move forward? Those are programs that are untapped right now. These are the kinds of things that we, we look around us. What we don't need, however, is to spend $500 million or start giving out to everybody who comes up with a good idea. Because what we see in that is bankruptcy and taxpayer money going down the drain. Let's look at the things we have. Let's look at the things that are out there that are practical, that are common sense. When we can look at that, then we can begin to solve this problem. Because right now, we've got to get it sustainable here, not dependent everywhere else. I interviewed one time for the Palm Beach, Florida Chamber of Commerce. I didn't take the job because the fellow that was retiring they wasn't paying him a whole lot of money. I had a wife and three children need all the money I could get. And I said, uh, they said, why didn't you take the job? I said, because my wife don't own three oil wells in Louisiana like his wife does. All right? He could, I could retire too. I'm saying drill, 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 natural gas. The whole county school system has just put a group of uh, natural gas buses in line. There's no, we look, we've got plenty of energy run the pipeline and drill. It's really that simple. It's not a complex problem. What it is is we have people in high elected offices who do not want to solve the problem. It's really that simple. Strong energy policy is what's going to get us from where we're dependent upon certain things around the world to where we can be independent. There's no doubt about that. I certainly would support the passage of the Keystone Pipeline to help things, and I would support Congressman Graves' bill that he put in with the Transportation Act to start blocking, block granting some of the uh, gasoline tax back to the states. More, the more you can put back to the states, the better off you're going to be. We have lots of energy here, and I'd love to find something tomorrow that's not oil or gasoline based. I would love it. No one would love it more than me. We don't have much wind here, though, although it felt like it coming up here today. Uh, we don't have, uh, we can't use solar because of the topography, but we can have opportunities for other things. You know, when, before Tom Graves ran for Congress the last time, he came to me and he said, you know, Martha, I, I know you're thinking about running for Congress, and if we both run, we're going to split the conservative vote, and a less conservative Republican is going to win. And he has done exactly what he promised to do, and what he didn't know at the time is that my mom and my sister both had cancer, and that I wasn't going to be running last time because I needed to be a daughter and a sister. But Tom Graves has gone and done what he said he was going to do. And isn't it sad that that is held up as something great, that somebody did what they promised they would do, that it's not expected? 
So I think if we follow the ideas that Tom put forth on the transportation tax, but also let's get Keystone passed. Let's drill, and as Cliff said, drill and drill. And it is, it is the way to go. We got to take care of today's needs today, and then we can worry about tomorrow once we become energy independent. Thank you. Well, we certainly, certainly do have some issues with energy. Um, number one thing, though, we have got to quit bowing to the environmentalist. You know, Anwar, offshore, uh, natural gas, there are too many opportunities out there for us to grow our energy independence. Uh, and we have to do that. Um, certainly the Keystone Pipeline, I'm, I feel that we will certainly get that pipeline. It just, it makes too much sense. And although our government sometimes doesn't do what makes sense, I think that uh, the American public understand the need for that to the point where we will rise up and see that we get that pipeline built so that, that those energy resources don't end up being shipped to China uh, out of Vancouver. Uh, I certainly uh, think that that's doable and it will happen. Uh, we're in a situation right now where we have an opportunity to become energy independent. Uh, I've, as Mark, you know, I'd love to have alternative energy sources, but they are not practical. And the leadership in this country is trying to drive prices to a point to where people step back and say, well, you know, maybe it does make sense, but it doesn't. They are artificially creating a price. Uh, ethanol, I mean, just think about what that has done to our food cost by the use of corn to produce ethanol. It's, it's just crazy policy. Well, that wraps up the uh, prepared issue questions. What we'd like to do now is to open this up for questions from the floor. Just raise your hand. There we go. MJ, you want to? Yes, heaven forbid. <coughs> if, heaven forbid, Obama is reelected, is there anything Congress can do about stopping this preposterous use of executive why don't we just, uh, we'll, everybody will have a chance. First of all, I'm, I'm somewhat apprehensive about Congress's ability to stop Obama. Uh, he has total disregard of our Constitution and total disregard for Congress. He does what he wants to do as long as he can get away with it. Short of impeachment, I don't know what we can do. I think there probably are and will be grounds for impeachment, though, if we can find a Congress that has the courage to go in that direction. But it will be a challenge. Let's just hope that he does not get reelected. And I implore all of you, do everything you can, reach everybody you know, uh, regardless of how conservative or liberal they are, try to help them see why we need a new president. Learn the talking points. Point out the things such as the Keystone Pipeline, things that he is, is doing to damage our country. And let's see if we can get him out of the White House once and for all. I think the one thing that we can do, and it's a great question, because what we have right now, and we have had over the last few years, is Congress over the, and then really you go back not just the past few years, you have Congress that has abdicated their constitutional role. Congress, one, controls the purse strings. That was where it was started. They can, they can fund and, and defund. And number two, they have oversight responsibilities for what is being carried out in the executive branch and other areas. Here's where we've abdicated the role. And we see that I've been able to work with this on the state level, but I think it's, it's much more important on the federal level. When these come out, there's several things you can do, short of impeachment, which may or may not happen. What you've got to look at is if when one comes up, let's, let's, have a, let's have a House and a Senate. And remember, the Senate's a crucial part of this as well. We got to get the Senate back. We got to take the presidency and the Senate, and then we got to have Republicans act like Republicans. When we get that, then we can be able to say, "Let's, let's, you burn, do executive orders, then let's bring this in." How are you going to fund it, Mr. President? Because we're not going to give you the money. You want to do it by yourself? Put them in an office. You fund it yourself. But guess what? You got to come back to us. This is where the Congress has got to take up and really look at its mandated constitutional role. And we've just abdicated that over the last few years. 
I happened to be privileged to be in the White House one day, and President Nixon gave me an autographed picture of himself. He actually handed it to me. Um, he was impeached. For what? Give me a break. What is going on now in the White House is preposterous. I would be delighted to introduce the legislation. You can blame it on me. I hope I don't get shot on the way home. You, I would be glad to introduce the legislation to impeach him, okay? Number two, Eric Holder, our Attorney General, should have already been impeached. Any man who can't determine what the truth is because it varies from circumstance to circumstance. We have the wrong people in leadership positions. I'm hoping and praying that he will not be reelected. I'm talking about President Obama. But if all else fails, yes, I think the Congress should make every effort to impeach him from office. This is why these elections are so important. This is why you can't send more of the same to Congress and the United States Senate. Because too many times they get up there and they whisper in their, your ear and they tell you you're going to be a rock star if you just do what they tell you to do. And then they say, oh, we can't do that or we can't do that because we don't want to rock the boat. Look, President Obama has overstepped uh, his authority in executive orders. I think there's no doubt about that. I think it's impeachable. But at the same time, we need to be very careful that we motivate people to put him out of office. Now, we've got to elect 30 or 40 more real conservatives to the House. We need to take back the Senate. And then there's about 13% of swing voters, and I'm speaking especially to women out there, okay, but the guys that know women, which I think is everybody here, there's about 13% of women that they're calling this time the Walmart moms. They're moms that voted for Obama in the last time, but they're not too happy about it because they're paying more at the pump, they're paying more at the grocery store, they are the ones that are paying the bills. And we need to make a list, everybody in this room, of 10 people you know that might have voted for President Obama the last time, especially women in that, in that $50,000 a year range, and talk to them and tell them why you're not voting for President Obama and swing them over. These are the people, this 13% of females decide every election. In 96, they were the soccer moms. In 2000, they were the security moms. They went through. We've got to take responsibility on every level. Thank you. Okay. Another question? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. The implication that has been raised in the last question and an overarching concern has to be whether or not there may be grounds ultimately for impeachment of the president. In any event, that's not going to happen without Republican leadership in the Congress. Given the Republican leadership we have had in the Congress, would you vote to continue it or replace it, particularly given what's happened in the House of Representatives in the last year? <laughs> I think what we've got in Congress right now is there is a lot of things going on from my understanding talking to several members and at this point as far as who may or may not run for a speaker or other leadership post I think is out there. One of the things you've got to be careful of is somebody may step forward that may be the same as what you've got. I think the issue that I brought up early, and I'm going to make this pretty short and sweet, when leadership is right, they will have Doug Collins vote. When leadership is wrong, they won't. I have proven that in, from my experience in the State House. When a speaker asked me to vote for a DOT uh, position in which he said, this is what we've got to have. And he made every promise in the world and sent everybody in the world to do it. And I said, you can't do it because my constituents, Chambers of Commerce and other people, and people even from up in Big Canoe and everywhere else called me and said, no, this gentleman's done a good job for us. After that happened, I joined Tom Gray's in becoming part of the Banished Five and understand what it means to be on the other side. But you have to take up. That's when we actually took up the finding a new speaker. I think the issue here is just being able to stand in and do what you say and being consistent and conservative in your message. That's where we've got to be. So I'd love to see who may step forward at this point in time. That person may or may not be better than what we've got. We've got to be ready, though, to say this is where we've got to, we've got to turn this nation around. I'll be glad to take any leadership role I can be elected to when I get to the Congress. I can't wait. I'll run for everything that's available, all right? Um, we have, you know, people say they're not going to do certain things until they get to where they're in the chair. And as I told somebody earlier, 
somebody's opening doors for you, you get to sit on the front row at the concert, you're sitting at the head table at the restaurant, first thing you know, you begin to believe you're somebody that can't be replaced. All right? I'm for term limits. I'm for voting people out who don't do what they say they're going to do. And what are they going to do to me if they do vote me out? I'll go home and pick up my grandson where I left him the last time. Somebody says, you're going to move off and leave your grandchildren. I said, no, we're going to eat down in the White House. <laughs> There certainly have been things in the House of Representatives that I haven't liked in the last year. However, if you look at what they have passed, when the President had his own jobs council that said what needed to be done to create jobs, there had been 30 bills that the House had passed that were stacked up like cordwood in the Senate. So, you know, the challenge I think that we have, and then let's just call it what you're saying. You're criticizing John Boehner, I think, the Speaker of the House, That's right? Correct. That's correct. Let's call it what it is, right? I'm not afraid to name a name. Right now, he is, he is a conservative congressman. He's never voted for an earmark. If you look at his record, he's very conservative. But he has a caucus of about 240 that has 100 conservatives and 140 not so conservative. I'm not going to call anybody a name, but not so conservative. Okay, and so he is a reflection of that caucus. That's why this election needs to send 20 or 30 or 40 more very conservative because he'll reflect his caucus because why? He wants to keep his power. Now, I'm not going to say yet whether I vote for him or not, okay, but he is a reflection of that caucus right now. And I'm not going to totally throw the Congress down, although I think that they, you know, they need to do more with budgets. They caved on payroll tax. You know, there's a whole list of things. But they did pass 30 job-creating bills that even the President's Commission said were job-creating, but Harry Reid won't take it out. So that's why you've got to get 30 or 40 more good folks in the Congress. You've got to take over the, the Senate. And then we've got to talk to our friends and neighbors who voted for President Obama. And I know all of you know some people who voted for President Obama. And you've got to convince them not to vote for President Obama. The challenge is a little bit greater than trying to get Obama ousted from the White House when it comes to getting the right senators in the Senate. Because we have two Republican senators in the state already. Sometimes I'm not sure just how conservative they are, but at least they're Republicans. It's difficult for us to reach out to people outside of this state into states where they have Democrats serving in the Senate. But if you do know people, uh, it would be greatly appreciated by me if you would try to get more Republicans elected into the Senate. That's, that's one thing we can do. Martha touched on this. There's this coalition and the hundreds she mentioned that are conservative Republicans in Congress, a large number of those were freshmen congressmen last year. They have held together in many instances and represent a unified front. And just as Martha mentioned, we need to elect more conservative congressmen to increase that number. When it expands to 120, 140, then all of a sudden the speaker has to listen to that group. I am one of those conservatives, extremely conservative, and I uh, think we need to elect more people such as myself to the Georgia delegation for Congress. And we got a couple of hands. How about this gentleman right here? Do you want to mic or can you? Uh, as a member of Georgia Carry, uh, dot org, we're a grassroots gun rights group in Georgia. I believe I would be derelict in my duties as a volunteer to, to not ask your opinion or your, your ideas on how you could uh, give us more of our 2A rights back uh, at a federal level. We're fighting hard here in the state to get that done. I know there's at least three members that I know of in this room, not counting myself. Um, you know, from abolishing the ATF would be a good start. Uh, just some ideas on, on your stance on the Second Amendment. Uh, look, I'm a strong Second Amendment supporter, as I think, you know, uh, most of us in this room are. Uh, I think that what you have to look at is how to restore some of the things that have been taken away. And we've got some bills, you know, if we have more Democrats elected to Congress, they're going to try to bring back the assault weapon ban. If you have, and you know, it's just a stair step. You know, they want to start in one place. And, it, and, and we get to the point, and I think what really couches what I think about this 
is that when you start giving up your liberty in return for safety, pretty soon you don't have liberty anymore. And if you use liberty as the basis of what you think about the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, any, any of, the, of the Bill of Rights, then you'll be on the right track. I think all of us would probably be very much in favor of our Second Amendment rights. We have to maintain that. It is crucial. It is critical. Uh, you know, there's some people that even speculate that our country would never be invaded by a foreign army simply because we are armed. All of us are armed, or not all of us, great majority of us. Uh, many of us have several weapons in our house, and as long as we maintain that right, we have liberty and freedom. If we give it up, and even inch by inch, we could lose it if we're not careful, and that's the problem. The enemy is wanting to just take small steps towards removing our freedoms and Second Amendment rights, one of it. We have to stand firm and strong and protect that, or there may be no end to where it stops. As a son of a Georgia State Trooper, I think the thing I didn't realize there was a difference in gun control. When I was growing up, I thought gun control meaning when you hit the target you were shooting at. <laughs> What we've got to look at here is this is, again, another part of consistent conservative action. Right now, I have been, in the last few years, we've had and been able to restore many gun rights and open uh, carry privileges. I'm a concealed carry permit uh, carrier myself, have it right now. One of the things, we've got also a bill in the Georgia House right now, Stephen Allison is sponsor, and I'm proud co-sponsor of that bill, that is going to expand even more that uh, reach that we can take law-abiding citizens who have played by the rules, who have done it right. Our Second Amendment rights are just like the, all the other rights. They're fundamental to keeping us safe and free, and I'll be continuing to do that in Washington. Okay. Uh, I, I notice a lot of you are Republicans up here, and I'm very much conservative. Um, if you could pinpoint, what would your uh, most liberal ideology be? And if you're not prepared to answer that question, what would be uh, be the flaw in your political beliefs or personal uh, area be as well? It reminds me of the job interview when they say, you know, what are your weaknesses? Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I um, uh, was a Southern Democrat like a lot of people were back in the, in the 70s and 80s. And in 1988, I, uh, the convention was coming to Atlanta. And so I figured what better way to find out if I'm really a Democrat or a Republican than to volunteer. I'm always a work from the inside kind of person. So I volunteered for the Dukakis campaign and I actually got to drive Kitty Dukakis around Atlanta for that whole week. Uh, and got to know them, and by the end of that week, I was like, I have nothing in common with these people because all they're doing is complaining about people who have more. How has that not changed in the last 30 years? They're still complaining about the people that have more. So I guess um, a flaw might be that I did vote for Mike Dukakis in 1988. That would be my flaw. Jimmy Carter made me a Republican. <laughs> And that goes back longer than I care to remember. Um, however, as, as far as any fatal flaw or weakness uh, towards the liberal side, um, my DNA just doesn't allow it. I'm just conservative to the bone. I, you know, if I tried to fight it, I'd get nowhere. I can't do anything about it. I want, I want to say that's one of the most unique questions in the, the hundreds that I've had over this last little bit, but it's a great question. And I think it goes back to heart. As far as liberal, I have to agree that, that liberal is not an issue in my vocabulary. But you talk about conservative and a flaw in that. I think one of the things that we have not done, and maybe I have not done, is related how one of the things that happened a few years ago is this president stole a word from us. This president stole hope. He stole it from a generation coming up because he said that hope is what you need and I'll give it to you from the government. Ladies and gentlemen, hope is when you get out of the way and you let young men and young women and men and women who have business, you get government out of the way, then you give them true hope. That's what I believe. And to answer the question, what's our fatal flaw? I think sometimes we don't explain that very well. We don't explain that conservative principles are not about restricting and, and all the things that the liberals want to make us out to be. Conservative principles are the thing that brought us to where we are, and that's what we've got to have. That's what we've got to communicate, and that's what we're going to be doing as we go along. Thank you for that question, because it brings out what we need to do in this next election. 
uh, my most liberal point of view is freedom of religion. You ought to be able to believe whatever you want to believe. If you want to go to hell, that's your business. <laughs> Try to be very brief since we're short on time, but we need to quit worrying about the United Nations, quit funding it, and not support the United Nations because they are going against what we stand for and what we represent as the United States. Agenda 21 is just an invasion on prop private property, and we need to fight it in every way we can. Agenda 21, and I'll, I'll be brief, it was one of the things that I've been learning about more over the last year. I think it's been the, the Tea Party has done a great job bringing out that uh, agenda, the hidden agenda in very subtle ways. And I have had a part of that in looking at it and learning. In fact, I've learned so much that it, it bothers me even more looking at this planning because it deals with property rights. It deals with the very basis of who we are. And again, when you learn about stuff, you admit it. I think the candidates on here have all said we all don't have every answer. But when you learn, you do something about it. That's called consistent conservative action. And one of the things this past week, Mark Hamilton, who is a Republican from Forsyth County and I introduced along with others, a resolution in the House that mimics Chip Rogers' resolution in the Senate that uh, calls for doing away with Gen 21 and getting away from it. I'd send it where I sent that last crowd that I spoke about. Um, agenda 21, there's, there's no room for Agenda 21 in the United States or in our world, to be honest with you. And I don't understand why we are sending foreign aid to China. Can you explain that to me? And why we are funding all these countries who hate us. My mother taught me as a child, you cannot buy friendship, and neither can the United States of America. Agenda 21 should be thrown out. We don't need a one world government. We don't need to be funding all these programs and all these countries who don't like us. I've been on record for a number of years saying that the biggest challenge of this century is going to be about property rights, about what you want to do with your property versus what the government wants you to do. And Agenda 21 is a perfect example of that. And I'm proud to have been the first candidate to come out against Agenda 21 with a strong statement about it. Uh, we need to have our own property rights dealt with on our own. First, what you own, you have control over. You get everything that looks like sustainability and that kind of thing out of the way. Now. Good conservationism is conservative values, okay? It is a conservative value. So I don't like us being painted as the people that are anti-environment because we're not. We have been conservationists from the beginning. So let us not confuse what good conservationist is, conservationism is because that's good. We want to do that. Agenda 21 in the United Nations, we don't need to be a part of that anymore. Thank you, uh, crowd. Now we'll get into the closing statements and uh, would ask if uh, each could try to do about a minute and a half or so. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> First of all, let me thank all of you for being so patient and kind as to listening to us. To me, as I may have said earlier, our number one priority right now should be our economy and our deficit. The questions, many of the questions that y'all have asked and have been asked of us are important. They're very important. And we need to focus on those. We need to work towards solving those issues and those problems. However, if we don't get control of our deficit, the rest kind of becomes a new point. We, that's got to be number one. We've got to control the deficit, cut spending, uh, put people in Washington, D.C. that know how to do that, uh, Doug mentioned legislation they've passed in the House and they're working on it in the Senate. Forty jobs. That's great. I commend them. That is outstanding. We need to do it. In my first year as chairman of the Jackson County Board of Commissioners, on a relative scale, we did what was probably 150 times that in Jackson County. We eliminated 18 jobs in a little small county because we had to balance our budget. I am physically responsible and physically conservative. So uh, 
I know how to go to Washington, D.C. and address the issues, the number one issue, and that's our deficit. Then we'll take care of the economy, create jobs, which I've also done. Thank you for your time. Good being here. Well, it has been good to be here today and to hear questions and hear from you. And you've got a chance to, to look and into us a little bit. And you're going to have a chance to go from here and look even further. Um, we all have websites. I have my own website I encourage you to go to. We have people here that can answer questions, and I'll be here to answer those as well. I think that this election is about uh, our beliefs. I think when you look up here, you have uh, issues that we can deal with and the answers that we've given that you can look at. I think it goes back to, to the consistent, conservative, and action. Because this is what it's going to take in Washington. Because right now, we, we sort of have been playing the game and went along and it's got us into the problems that we're at right now. It's not easy. It's not going to be something that can be changed overnight. But you've got to start somewhere. And as I said a few minutes ago, what I want to do in this campaign is go back around and is everywhere I go is give that message of hope and telling people that we can get better, that we can continue to build freedoms back. And when we build the freedoms back and we give it, uh, the people what they can do on their own, we dream again as a country. That's what my candidacy is about. It's about doing the conservative action that needs to happen in this country. That's what I'm going to continue to do. And it's just been a blessing to be here today and seeing you take a Saturday to care for your country and to care for this district. Thank you so much. And I would like to add my thanks to that. Thank you for allowing us to come and be a part of your community and share our ideas of advancing our country. I have spent my lifetime finding solutions or helping to find solutions to problems. That's what you do when you have the positions that I've had over the years. Uh, my business card is on the back table. I hope you will, I'm still in business. I hope you will pick up my business card as you leave. And also a copy of my resume. A resume which lines out what I've done over the years to help Georgia and help create jobs in Georgia. I do believe the economy is the number one issue. I told you there were 20 pages of foreclosures in the Gainesville Times. Here they are. 20 pages of foreclosures. When I moved to Gainesville in 1981, you couldn't find a page, much less 20. We've got to do something about creating jobs. The ninth District is a large area where you may not be hurting in this immediate area, there are parts of our district that are suffering greatly. If we don't get the economy straightened out, it won't make a whole lot of difference what happens elsewhere. I want to remind you of this. This is a history lesson. It was only when the German economy ran in the ditch that Hitler was allowed to take over. Thank you all for having me here today, and, and I look forward to getting to know many of you. I've been listening to you for the last 15 years, and I've been helping you out with the projects that you have um, from large to small, and I look forward to doing that again uh, when you elect me to Congress. But i got to tell you, a lot of people talk about how important uh, legislative experience is, and a lot of people have said that about me. Martha, you don't have legislative experience. But I'll say what my friend Herman Cain has said. How's that working for you so far? <laughs> Electing people that have legislative experience and not common sense experience. People that have run businesses, large and small. People that have raised a family. And i got to tell you, the four little children that I've raised, I have seen a lot in them that I've seen in Washington, D.C. And I can handle a lot of those things as a result of that. It's been small businesses and large businesses and taking you with me to Washington. It's so important that we don't just do more of the same. We are at a critical point where we've got to have people that say, why are we doing it this way? And more importantly, why not do it this way to show an opportunity to do it better? I appreciate all of you so much. I look forward to getting to know you. I'll be around to answer any questions that you have. You can go to Martha for Congress for more information, and I look forward to talking a lot more with you. Thank you. Uh, folks, that concludes our, uh, our forum. At the very least, I would like to give every one of these qualified candidates a big, big canoe thanks for coming and making time this afternoon.